I'm Brad Wilcox, and we want to welcome you to our scripture discussion. I'm here with some wonderful friends, some great colleagues. This is Brad Farnsworth and Brother George Pierce and Carrie Mulestein. And we are excited today to be able to talk to each other and share with you some thoughts about the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine is taught very overtly in the Book of Mormon in two places. It's taught subtly in other places, but let's start with the very direct teachings of the doctrine found in 2 Nephi 31, and then the visit of Jesus Christ to the Americas. Now, as we look at the Book of Mormon, there are a few places where the doctrine is, is taught very overtly, and one of those is in 2 Nephi 31, and we read in verse 21, And now behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way, and there is none other way, nor name given under heaven, whereby men can be saved in the kingdom of God. And now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ, and the only and true doctrine of the Father. Then he speaks about faith. Look at the bottom of verse 19. Ye have not come thus far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him, repentance, baptism by water, and then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. Then if we skip down to verse 20, you see the element of enduring to the end. Ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Then we get verse 15, I heard a voice from the Father saying, Yea, the words of my beloved are true and faithful. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. And, and so you get both that endure to the end, but the, um, the Father and the Son bearing witness of each other. And that's, a really, that's really strongly highlighted in 3 Nephi 11. And so we go to the, the visit of the Savior in the Americas. Believe in me. Just before that, repent. So we've got faith, repentance. Verse 33, and whoso believeth in me and is baptized, there's the baptism. And then we have at the bottom of 35, and with the Holy Ghost, visit him with fire and with the Holy Ghost. And then if we go to 38, and again I say unto you, ye must repent and be baptized in my name and become as a little child. A process that definitely takes enduring, enduring to the end. In verse 32, the Father hath given this unto me, and yet we call it the doctrine of Christ, but Christ pays tribute to the Father who is the author. That's exactly right. And you see Christ do that all throughout the New Testament and in his visit in 3 Nephi, constantly saying, this isn't really for me. So Nephi will say, this is of Christ, and Christ will say, well, this is of me, but it's really from the Father, which highlights kind of our job, which is to get people to come to Christ, and then Christ brings them to the Father. So. I think that's an important point, and that, that ties right into this idea that they bear witness of each other. Again, in verse 32, um, I bear record of the Father, and the far Father beareth record of me, and the Holy Ghost beareth record of the Father in me. And I bear record that the Father commandeth all men everywhere to repent and believe in me. And so then we will launch into that idea, but each time it's kind of, uh, the precursor is that the, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost bear witness of each other. And then I think that it always ends with a big emphasis on the Holy Ghost. So if, if we were to go back to 2 Nephi 32, and then in verse 5, again, I say unto you that if you will enter in by the way and receive the Holy Ghost, it will show unto you all things what you should do. And then he says, behold, this is the doctrine of Christ, and there will be no more doctrine. So he's just equated the words of Christ with the Holy Ghost. And it, because he said that the words of Christ will tell you all things, well, really, you need to receive the Holy Ghost, and that will tell you all things that you should do. So in this iteration, the emphasis is on enduring to the end by doing whatever the Holy Ghost tells you to do. And that's what the Word of Christ is, whether it's from reading the Scriptures. Well, I think that would also go along with the idea of the Holy Ghost being a sanctifier. Good. Because as we endure to the end, then we are sanctified, and through the process of endurance, and then as we're sanctified, we're able to endure. So I think that that also ties in with the Holy Ghost. That's perfect. So I, I think you're right. Let's, let's, let's then go to 3 Nephi 27, where it talks about that specifically. He says, This is the gospel which I have given unto you, that I came into the world to do the will of my Father, because my Father sent me. So again, you get that idea 
that it's the, the father uh, that is driving this and the relationship between them. And then we get uh, verse 14, he's going to draw all men unto him, as, as Brad was talking about, that that's what it's really all about. And we get, and it shall come to pass that whoso repenteth and is baptized in my name shall be filled. We, he's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. We'll talk about that. And if he endure to the end, behold, him will I hold guiltless. Now this is the commandment, repent all ye ends of the earth and come unto me and be baptized in my name that you may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost that you may stand spotless before me at the last day. And then he gets the inclusive, I say and do this in my gospel. So in 2 Nephi 31 we had the Holy Ghost teaches you what to do. In 3 Nephi 11 you talked about the Holy Ghost bears witness of the Father and the Son. In 3 Nephi 27 the Holy Ghost sanctifies you. Let's go to one other one if we were to go to Moroni chapter 8. This is a really short one. We're seeing some beautiful uh, descriptions of the different roles played by the Holy Ghost. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think the Holy Ghost ends up being, at, at, at the end of all these iterations of the doctrine of Christ, it's always the Holy Ghost, but it's a, a different role. It's, it's, as you said, it's beautiful. Which comforter filleth with hope and perfect love, which love endureth by diligence unto prayer? Now, in 2 Nephi 32, after he'd said you need to do everything the Holy Ghost sa says, the next thing he said is, and you need to keep praying for that, and you have to keep praying. And we saw in 3 Nephi 27, how he says you have to ask. And, and that was also in 3 Nephi, 2 Nephi 32. Um, so here again he has that you need to be praying. So that prayer, in, in during to the end, always seems to be a part of it. But this time the emphasis of the Holy Ghost is being filled with charity. So you always have to have this prayer to get the Holy Ghost with you to help you to endure to the end. Yeah, beautiful. You know, in chapter 32, you, you emphasize doing it. Same thing in verse 21 of 27 of 3 Nephi. It's do, do, do. This is like President Kimball had on his desk. Do you remember the little sign, yeah. do it? Oh. So my father had this on his desk for many <laughs> years. So we're going to put that right there. So we do these things. We do it. Just like President Kimball invited us to while he was prophet. Good, and, and I, th I love that because you're right at verse 21 where he says, Do the works which ye have seen me do, even that shall ye do. And that was how it started out in 2 Nephi 31, if you remember, where he said we have to follow the example of Christ. And if you think about it, when, when we're going to talk about something like the doctrine of Christ, and it's, it's said so many times, but it's such a short thing, it, it seems like he's saying to us, these are the most important things. Get these things down. And in almost all of the examples of where he talks about it, that's a strong element. Do what you've seen me do. Follow the example of Christ. Or Nephi says, remember I saw what Christ did and that we need to do the same thing. Uh, I don't know how we can escape both the saving element that you mentioned, which, which comes in, in especially 3 Nephi 11 and 27 where he says he draws all men up to him to be saved, but our role in following his example, which we only know how to do through the Holy Ghost. Yeah. I think that ties in with uh, there's that initial sanctification, right, to get us to that point, and then there's a progressive sanctification after that to increasingly get us to be more like Christ as we live like Him, following the Holy Ghost. The, the more we live like Him, then the more we're empowered. It, it then it's almost as if we progress through levels of being able to receive His help. that brings us back to that beautiful part of 2 Nephi 32 where as we get to one level we'll know what we're supposed to be doing and then as, as we are kind of mastering that level well the Holy Ghost shows you all things you should do so it will now teach you the next thing you should do and that's the Word of Christ that's what we have to be feasting on that's what we have to be pressing and holding tight to because the moment we stop following what the Holy Ghost is telling us to do our progress is stopped. And faith in Jesus Christ compels action there's the doing. It, we obviously will emulate him. We will do it because we have faith in Jesus Christ. We've been talking about very obvious instances of the doctrine of Christ in 2 Nephi 31 or in 3 Nephi 11, but the doctrine of Christ permeates scriptures. And so if we go all the way back to 1 Nephi 8, all the way back to 1 Nephi 8, and, and we think about Lehi's vision, there are elements here that we can pull out that say this is obviously symbolic of the doctrine of Christ as we want to take a look at it. Because as we look throughout the Book of Mormon, and, and we can even see this in the New Testament, as the doctrine of Christ is proclaimed, 
the beauty, the genius of, of these speakers in the Book of Mormon and in the New Testament is that they adapt it for their audience. Right? We think about the doctrine of Christ to me and we automatically, it comes to mind, faith, repentance, and receiving the Holy the Ghost, article of faith. Right? And, and endurance to the end and, and baptism you know, before receiving the Holy Ghost. And so we can, we can sort of rattle these things off. As we look at scripture, we can start to see that there are elements of the doctrine of Christ that are tailored for each audience and are tailored for those who are supposed to receive it, but it's still going to prompt those actions. So 1 Nephi 8. Lehi says in verse 11, It came to pass that I did go forth and partake of the fruit thereof, and I beheld that it was most sweet. And therefore it filled my soul with exceeding great joy, and I began to be desirous that my family should also partake of it also. And so we see that, that part of this is we look at the symbolism. Clearly, right, Lehi is not saying, and then I repented after prayer, and then I had faith, and then I was baptized. By partaking of that fruit, as we know that Nephi talks about the fruit of the tree, right, the tree being the love of God, the fruit symbolic of the atonement. As he partakes of the atonement through his repentance, right, if we want to sort of interpret the symbols that way, then he it prompts him to action, right? He wants other people to partake of it. It's going to prompt him to go out and to do things. And as we go forward, again, Lehi's vision, Nephi's following vision that, that, that Nephi gives, both of their visions don't talk about, and then we were baptized, and then we were this, in, in so explicit terms. Yeah, not terms. necessarily a set order. No. And even in the, in the scriptures that I was reviewing at the very beginning, uh, I was skipping verse to verse to put it into the order that we're familiar with. But right. it didn't necessarily come that way in the scriptures. No, in all of those, it's, it's a different order. Every single one, all the elements are always there, but it's a different yeah, order. Interesting. But we see another element of the doctrine of Christ and his vision in verse 19. And I beheld a rod of iron, and it extended along the bank of the river and led to the tree by which I stood. And of course, we know the rod of iron is the word of God. And he says, I know I also beheld a straight and narrow path which came along by the rod of iron, even to the tree. It leads by a fountain, and he sees new, numberless courses of people who are pressing forward. Those that get to the tree have, have clung to the, the um, rod of iron. And so we can see this talking about then this endurance, this concept of endurance that seems to be prevalent every time the doctrine of Christ step is, after pre step. is presented. And it's pressing. Yeah. It's, it's not just pressing, surviving, not survival, it's, it's pressing. It's pressing for it's clinging as we, as we sort of see this. It's not just sort of holding on in, in a casual way, but very much pressing forward as, as we say. So we can see in, even as early as Lehi's vision and then Nephi's vision later on and, and his interpretation of, of these two things, that the doctrine of Christ is there. It's just being given to them in terms and in, in symbols that they're going to understand. It's clear that when Nephi is talking to us in 2 Nephi 31 and 32 that he is drawing on this language. This is where he first starts to get this idea. By the time he's writing 2 Nephi 31 and 32, it's crystallized in his mind enough through the Holy Ghost, I assume, uh, to understand, I can say this as the doctrine of Christ, but he's drawing on this language because this is where he gets it, and that imagery can help us understand well, it. Well, and that's well. who Nephi is. He's been reflecting on this for years, yeah. his father's dream, and that's who he is. That's how he thinks. Yeah, yeah so formative. Good. Sorry. And, and no, and that's great. And then because this concept of the tree of life is so um, foundational in the Book of Mormon that it keeps reappearing in other places, whether it's explicitly or implicitly. The Book of Mormon um, speakers and, and prophets are going to refer back to the Tree of Life motif in, in several ways. In fact, let's take a look. So Alma 32. If you were to do a word search and just look through Alma 32 to 34, nowhere do they say explicitly, this is the doctrine of Christ and this is what you have to believe and start off with faith, repentance, baptism, receiving the Holy Ghost and enduring to the end. That's not what they do. They know their audience. So contextually, as they're dealing with the Zoramites, these people who have an idea that they're special and no one else is, that Christ is not coming, there is no Christ, or anything else like that, Alma and Amulek can't go in and immediately start talking about baptism or start talking about the Holy Ghost or anything else. They have to start way back and go forward. So as we look at Alma 32, he starts off by talking about faith. And so he's going to build on faith. Right? And so he's going to talk about um, faith not having to have a perfect knowledge of things in Alma 32, verse 21. Therefore, if you have faith, you have hope for things which are not seen, which are true. And he's going to talk about faith. And he's going to talk about the things that, that, or give the example that we're all familiar with in verse 28. We will compare the word unto a seed. And as he goes forward, as he talks about faith, he talks about nourishing the tree. 
right? or not nourishing the tree and seeing how the tree is going to bring forth fruit. But what's really interesting is when he talks about it in verse 40, and he talks about what happens if they neglect. Alma 32, verse 40, And thus, if ye will not nourish the word, looking forward with an eye of faith to the fruit thereof. Now he switched from the tree metaphor. He's talking to the actual, like, nourishing it with their faith. Ye can never pluck of the fruit of the tree of life. He's gone right back to Lehi's vision and said, you can't partake of the atonement if you're not going to go forward in faith. This is, in a way, uh, this whole sermon is on one little part of the doctrine one of Christ. One tiny part of the doctrine the, of Christ. The beginning. Yeah, yeah and just and just so as we look through, he goes through and he talks to them. And he talks to them about faith. He talks to them about prayer. And what's really interesting, if you, if you just do a word search and look and just read through the chapters, you'll note that Alma doesn't even mention the title of Christ. He brings up the Son only after he's talked about to them about how they can pray. Then he brings up the Son of God, right? And then he starts to right, close off, and he says in Alma 33, verse 22, cast about your eyes and begin to believe in the Son of God. So it's the first time he's really pressed home the idea that there's a Son of God. Note and that, that casting eyes phrase also comes from, from 1 Nephi 8. From 1 Nephi 8. Yeah. And so, Look at the connections there. And so see what they're doing is they're not coming in and hammering and saying, you're all wrong and you need to believe in Christ immediately. They say, let's start with faith. Right? Work and nourish your faith so you can partake of, the, of the, the fruit of the tree of life. Cast your eyes around just like Lehi, just like Father Lehi did, and then right, believe in the Son of God. And he will come to redeem his people. He shall suffer and die to atone for their sins, and that he shall rise again from the dead, which shall bring to pass the resurrection, that all men shall stand before him to be judged at the last and judgment day according to their works. You know, it, it occurs to me as we go through this, and we've said that the doctrine of Christ is so core and essential, and yet it, it, it's these short little statements, right? I mean, it's, none of these are long passages. Second Nephi 31, 32 is the longest. And yet, even with these, these concepts that we know so well, faith, repentance, endurance, witnesses, praying, Holy Ghost, if you wanted to study each one of those concepts in detail, you could have a semester-long course where you still wouldn't scratch the surface on studying the doctrine of Christ because each one of those is so profound in and of itself, even though yeah, it seems simple it, at the beginning. It's also important that we remember that from studying, we could study it forever, or as our little, our little reminder from President Kimball, or we could do it. do it. And there has to be an application of this doctrine. Yeah, and that's what Nephi did. He applied what his father was teaching. If we go to 3 Nephi 11, this is where, as you've mentioned, the, the Savior teaches the 12 disciples about the doctrine of Christ. It's towards the end of chapter 11 that he says, this is why this is so important. Look at verse 39, 3 Nephi 11. Mm -hmm. Verily, verily, I say unto you that this is my doctrine. And whoso buildeth upon this, buildeth upon my rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. As I think that, you know, what is the rock? Well, of course, Jesus Christ is the foundation of the rock and His atonement. But what He's also saying is doctrinally, as teachers, we need to lay a foundation of faith in Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. And then any question that might come up regarding the doctrine, regarding the application of the doctrine. We come back to this foundation, and it reminds me of a talk by Elder Anderson back in October 2008, right after he was in the Quorum of the Twelve. He, was, he reflects upon when he was thinking as a young man about a future mission. And he said, Elder Anderson felt inadequate and unprepared. He remembers praying, quote, Heavenly Father, how can I serve a mission when I know so little? As he prayed, the feeling came to him. You don't know everything, but you know enough. Faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things. Faith, faith is to know enough to take the next step. And then, for example, think of Nephi. I'm going back to 1 Nephi chapter 11, where he has his great vision. After the Spirit of the Lord leaves, then the angel appears to him. And he poses what question? Knowest thou the condescension of God? And what does Nephi say very honestly, very innocently? He says, is that going to be on the test? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I always get. <laughs> yes, it will. That's, That's what I it's always say. Ultimately, it will ultimately Nephi, be on the Nephi test. responded, 
I know that he loveth his children, nevertheless I do not know the meaning of all things. And so even Nephi confesses, there's a lot of things he doesn't understand, but here's the, the wonderful formula or the, the, the pattern, is that when he says, you know, I really don't know what it is, then it's revealed to him. And that's where the angel of the Lord shows him, of course, this beautiful divine parentage that Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father in the flesh with a mortal mother. And then later on, he says again, knowest thou the condescension of God? And then he talks about the Savior coming down as God. As I look at all of this, there's so many things to take away, but I guess the thing that's hitting me the most is that for so many reasons, we need to be praying and having the Spirit with us. And if the Holy Ghost is with us, it does all those different things that we need it to do that will only happen through prayer and faith. But the Holy Ghost in our lives is so crucial and so key. Having the Holy Ghost in our lives is important because it's going to help us to endure to the end. It's the question that Nephi answers in 2 Nephi 32. And as I look at the doctrine of Christ and as I see things reflected in the scripture, one of the important applications that we get out of this is to endure to the end from Lehi's vision all the way through to Christ talking to the Nephites in 3 Nephi 26 and 27. Endurance is mentioned or hinted at throughout the Book of Mormon when they talk about the doctrine of Christ. Endurance is talked about in the New Testament and the Apostolic Church as they go forward. We are facing similar situations. Maybe we're not being put to death in, in Roman arenas or anything or facing extinction like the Nephites, but we still have tests and trials every day, and it's about enduring to the end. And we can do that through the work of the Holy Ghost. If we were to go to the Preach My Gospel manual on page one, it begins by showing the missionary's purpose. Invite others to come unto Christ by helping them receive the restored gospel through faith in Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. All of the missionary discussions, all of the missionary's lessons, all the missionary's contacts should be based on the foundation of the doctrine of Christ. It is the foundation upon which people will receive testimonies and follow the pattern, go to the bat, uh, baptismal font, receive the waters of baptism, receive the Holy Ghost, and then endure to the end. Well, thank you for the insights that you've shared, and thank you for joining us. I'd like to end by just reminding us of the words of Nephi in 2 Nephi 31:21. And now behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way. It's not a way. It's not another nice way. This is the way. And there is none other way nor name given under heaven whereby man can be saved. We live in a time when people are rejecting organized religion. We live in a time where people say spirituality is all they need. They don't need religion. And People reject the idea of one true church or any absolute truth. You have your truth. I have my truth. And as long as you're true to your own truth. But that's not the language that's used by Nephi or by these other prophets in the Book of Mormon that we've been discussing. This is the way, none other way, nor name given under heaven whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. And now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ. I bear testimony that the doctrine of Christ may not be a politically correct or popular thing. It may not be like something that is going to be socially acceptable, but it's true. And it was true in the day that these prophets wrote about it, in the day that the Savior taught about it, and it's true today. I hope that the discussion we've had today can motivate all of us to action, that we can do it, and that we can actually show our faith by living the doctrine of Christ and seeking the Spirit to tell us the other things that we need to do as we take these steps of faith. Uh, thank you for being with us, and I bear my testimony of the reality of Jesus Christ, of his atonement and his doctrine. And I say it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.